A big part of my career has been looking at the therapeutic value of the 12 steps because the 12 steps really have harnessed some powerful psychological forces that creates an amazing change in our life. What does that change? Well, the truth is, is that the 12 steps are engineered to help us achieve emotional sobriety, to achieve true independence of spirit, to achieve autonomy, to learn how to take care of ourselves. These are things that we don't know. Emotional sobriety really helps us learn how to have a healthy relationship, how to have union with the preservation of our integrity, how to cooperate with integrity. Most of us get lost in our relationships. Most of us do a lot of things we don't want to do. We don't really know how to show up in a good way. Emotional sobriety is about learning to have healthy relationships. Well, as I mentioned earlier, is we're going to try an experiment tonight. We're going to try something a little different instead of me or Tom or Raj or her presenting on this chapter, which is, you know, living life on life's terms. What I'm going to do is take about 10 or 15 minutes and I'm going to summarize the high points, the essence of what this chapter is about. And then we're going to open it up for you to share. Now, the sharing is going. Oh, we need a timer tonight, too, by the way. The, the sharing is going to be limited to three minutes, right? But it needs to stay focused on this chapter. And what we want you to share about is what you've learned in this chapter that can help you develop emotional sobriety in your life. What stood out? What, what concept, what idea that we've discussed through the last, I guess, five weeks now that you really picked up and made a difference. And if you have a specific example, even all the better. So we're looking at application and integration of this concept and to be able to share that. And so we wanna see um, if we're able to um, invite that and invite your participation to kind of deepen and enrich, and, and enrich the experience we're having with this chapter. So let me start by summarizing this chapter on living life on life's terms. Well, living life on life's terms requires a major shift in our consciousness. And it's a major shift because our consciousness before emotional sobriety is very much grounded in a very, very young consciousness. It's grounded in a consciousness that is very much riddled with shoulds and supposed tos. It's a consciousness that creates this sense of that my life is contingent on all of these things going the way that I want them to go for me to be all right. And so therefore we have all of these shoulds and supposed tos on how we're supposed to be, how our partner is supposed to be, how life is supposed to be, how God is supposed to be. The list can go on and on ad infinitum. What we move towards is we move towards an accepting life on life's terms, meaning we move towards what is and away from what should be. Let me emphasize that again. We move away from what should be and we move towards what is. The more we are grounded in what is, the more we are going to have an honest relationship with reality. The more we move, the more we are, our consciousness is influenced by shoulds and supposed to, the more we're going to be out of aligned and having a dishonest relationship with reality. Now, what you see is that these shoulds, these supposed tos generate a lot of expectations. And so these expectations are woven into this undifferentiated consciousness, this immature consciousness that we all have until we start to take on the task of growing ourselves in, in this direction. 
Now, some of these expectations are quite obvious. You're quite aware of them when they happen. Oh, my God, that guy shouldn't have been driving like that. You know, oh my God, he's putting me in danger. He shouldn't have cut me off, right? Things like that. Um, but most of these expectations, especially the ones in our more intimate relationship, are typically quite unconscious. We don't realize them until the, the unenforceable rule that is generated that is spawned from the expectation gets violated. And then we find ourselves upset. Now, this is what makes unpacking our emotional disturbance so important. Because a big part of emotional sobriety is learning to let go of these expectations that we have. In fact, it's at the heart of what emotional sobriety is, as we're going to talk about. Now, letting go of these expectations, right, either those that are obvious or those that are hidden, are going to be our greatest challenge. And why? Because for many of us, we think our expectations are reasonable. Even though somebody else might say they're outrageous, for us, we experience our expectations as reasonable. Because it's hard to accept we're outrageous. <laughs> but each and every one of us are with the kind of expectations we have. So they're going to be a big challenge. And we need two things in order to surrender our expectations. And the first is something that we've spent some time talking about this time, and that is humility. We have to have a humility that's grounded in the idea that I don't have any business expecting you to live up to my expectations. Nor am I here to live up to yours. And that takes humility. It takes letting go with this idea that I know Father knows best, right? We, we, we all saw that movie growing up if you're my age. But we have to let go of this idea that I know what's best. Now, maybe I know what's best for me if I've done a lot of work and I have some sense of myself and things like that. But I still learn about that all the time. But I don't know what's best for you. I don't know what you should be doing in your life to make things work. I can tell you what I want, and this doesn't stop us. If I say, hey, I'd like this from you. Hey, Raj, I'd like to hang out with you more. I can say that to him, and Roger can decide if he wants to do it or not. See, that's the great thing about emotional sobriety. It creates room for two people. So I can make requests of things that I want, but when they are, when those requests are generated from dependency, they're not requests, they're demands. And if Roger, if it was making a demand and he didn't want to spend time with him, I would probably shame him or do some other, have some other kind of tactic to try to manipulate him to get him to do what I want to do, want him to do. So humility, the humility that says I have no business putting my expectations on you is so important. It reminds me of the Gestalt therapy prayer, and you guys have heard me say it before, but it's it's so powerful. It says, I do my thing, you do your thing. I am I, you are you. I'm not in this world to live up to your expectations, and you're not in this world to live up to mine. If by chance we meet, fine, let's enjoy that. If not, it just can't be helped. The second thing that we need to do is we have to have the ability to roll with the punches. We have to have a flexibility in our in the way that we function in our relationship to our experience with reality. I want to read you a, a section of, of what Dr. Brandon says about autonomous individuals. And we're going to think about autonomy as an essential characteristic of having emotional sobriety, right? Because autonomy means that that I am the determining force in my life, not you. And that's what I lose when I'm emotionally dependent. 
He says autonomous individuals have a greater capacity to roll with the punches, to see, and listen to how he's right-sized this, to see the normal frictions of everyday life in a realistic perspective. Not to get their feelings hurt over trivia, or even if they are hurt occasionally, not to catastrophize such moments. Wow. See, that's being right-sized. So one way of looking at this whole thing about living life on life's terms is staying right-sized in our relationship to life and not turning, you know, anthills into mountains, but also not taking a mountain and turning it into an anthill. Have an appropriate and honest relationship with reality. Now, Viktor Frankl, and I quote him at the end of this chapter, you know, who was in a concentration camp, and he was looking at, uh, in fact, he was transferred to four different Nazi concentration camps before he was liberated at Auschwitz. You know, what he was looking at is what would it take from a psychological and spiritual perspective for those people to survive these heinous, you know, egregious conditions that they were facing on a daily basis in these death camps. And you know what he said? He says, we had to let go of our expectations, that it did not matter what we expected from life. And those that made it were those that were able to shift from letting, or those that were able to let go of what they expected from life and instead took on the challenge of what life expected from them. And I'll leave you with this final thought. Real maturity is being able to walk into a situation and let that situation control you and for you to have the most appropriate response to that situation, given where you at and what you need at that point in time. I'm just going to do this quickly. I'm going to summarize uh, 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 Alan's uh, long summary. Okay. Lighten up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks, Al. That took care of it. Man, a few words. I was going to say, we we have to say something worthy of being recorded, Tom, mm. because Alan re, restarted the recording. Um, lighten up. I like that. Lighten up. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to share one thing. There's There's a Buddhist writer that I like to read. And it really struck me a number of years ago when I was reading one of her talks that she gave. And this is obviously from, from her perspective as a teacher of, of Buddhism. So not everyone has to agree with it at all. But she said her perspective is, and it's just another way of saying what Alan and Tom were saying. Mm -hmm. She said, there's really only one thing that we can count on in life. Only one thing. We have all these ideas, as Alan was saying, about how life should be and how we should be and how other people should be and so on and so on. But she said there's only one thing that we can really count on. And that is that life will be exactly as it is. Life and reality will be exactly as it is. Whether we think it's wonderful, whether we think it's horrific, whether we think it's neutral and boring, those are our reactions, our assessments to how we're perceiving life because our thoughts and perceptions and especially our emotions have everything to do with how we're perceiving life and the events and circumstances in our lives rather than what they actually are, however able we are to get close to that, right? Which is is often a big challenge for me, at least. But she said life will be exactly as it is, apart from our wishes, apart from our hopes, apart from our expectations, apart from our desires. And in the surrender to reality, the surrender to truth, is where we can find whatever measure of peace that we're able to find. Now, as we said last week, that doesn't mean we're passive in life. 
I'm not using surrender in that sense. I'm using surrender more in the sense of, of acceptance, like you've heard us talk about a lot. And then I still need to figure out my response, right? I still need to figure out what I'm going to do. I still need to figure out what changes. I do have some influence or, or, or power to affect or to create because we can change future reality, right? Based on our current actions. But I can't do a thing to change the reality of the past or of this moment, right? It is as it is. And that made a big impression on me. I still struggle with doing that every day, of course, like I think we all do. And especially when reality isn't what I want it to be, or I have a major loss or a major illness, or even worse, somebody I care about a lot has a major illness. It's hard. As Ellen talked about in his chapter where he talked about Charlene, whose daughter became so ill and who eventually lost her daughter. It's hard. It's unbelievably hard. But eventually it's this process of coming to terms with reality. And the shock and everything we go through when reality is not what it's supposed to be, that's just part of the normal process too, as far as I'm concerned. Otherwise, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be re reacting with confusion and disorientation and anger and fear and frustration when things aren't the way we want them to be. That's also all part of the normal process of dealing with life from my perspective, but if we keep trying to move toward this idea of getting closer and closer to what reality is and to accepting it as it is, my experience is it can help a lot on that journey. So thank you, you guys. Does someone need to believe in God to successfully overcome addiction? Well, the way I like to think about what the program does, it connects us to who we really are. And what does that mean? Well, there's this incredible force in you and I, this growth force. It's the force that moved us from crawling to walking. You wanted to take those first steps. And when you fell, and you fell a lot of times, you didn't let your failures stop you. You picked yourself up, you learned from it. And how many times did you fail before you walked? You failed as many times as you needed to. You see that force, I call it a biological imperative, a psychological imperative, a spiritual imperative. It's moving you towards wholeness. It's moving you to be what you can be. Just like in the acorn is all the information it needs to become an oak tree. In you is all the information you need to become you. Become a you that can cope with life and to deal with whatever you need to deal with to be okay. And that's what I'll talk about in my new book, The 12 Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety. <laughs>